Hey guys, and today I want to talk to you about the Israel-Palestine conflict. Now, I do want to say that this is a very complicated battle, an ongoing saga, and I will say this, that no matter what view or opinion you have, there is no way that in this video that I'm going to be able to go into the depth to touch on every element or every argument that's being mentioned. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my time to go over some of the most important elements that I personally see and that I'm aware of. I am not claiming to be an authority on this, but I do want to go through some of the history, some of the past events, some of the religious significance and some of the current conflict that's been going on in Palestine and Israel at the moment. And I want to do my best to explain it to you. So stay tuned. The modern conflict as we know it all started with the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire obviously spanned over vast, a vast portion of Europe, around Asia and the Middle East, and also the northern coast of Africa. This would have included the historical land of Israel. Now, I'm deliberately saying the historical land of Israel because we know that there was a Jewish population of people living in Israel at the time of the Romans. We have many historical accounts of this that the Jews once did live in the land called Israel or Palestine today. And we know this happened. The Jewish people were forced out of their homeland by the Romans and they were scattered across the nations of the world. This was 2000 years ago. The claims for Jews having the land are thousands of years old. Now, of course, when one empire forms, we start to see another one begin to rise up in its place. And so we start to see the Ottoman Empire coming in more recent history. The Ottoman Empire spanned over the Eastern Europe, through to the Middle East and over the northern tip of Africa, much like the Roman Empire, but not reaching as far into Europe. The Ottoman Empire was a little bit different to the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire all answered to Caesar and Caesar was considered Lord there, but it was not so in the Ottoman Empire. Within the Ottoman Empire there was tolerance for different religions and for different groups and even to some degree some sense of autonomy, whereas the Roman Empire everyone had to be able to answer to Caesar, even if it did appear that people could govern themselves. With the Ottoman Empire it, there was a lot more freedom, particularly with the practice of religion. Of course, the Ottoman Empire fell during the First World War. The group that ran the Ottoman Empire were called the Young Turks and they decided that in order to modernise their empire they needed to be on the side of the winners of the war and they thought it would be Germany. So the Ottoman Empire went to war on the side of Germany against the British. And so we see the Ottoman Empire sending troops to battle. Of course, the British didn't take too kindly to this, so they started to look for someone within the Middle East to raise up a revolution to overthrow the Ottoman Empire so that the Ottoman Empire would have to fight amongst itself and against the British, thus making it easy for the British to win this battle. And they ended up getting in contact with a man who would later become the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem. This man was tasked with encouraging Arabs to fight against the Ottoman Empire under the false promise that they would one day have their own Arab nation given to them. So now we get into this interesting place that we see both Arabs and Jews fighting on both sides of the First World War. One very famous Jew known as Fitz Haber, he actually fought on the side of Germany because he was living in Germany at the time. And he's the Jewish man responsible for the creation of the first chemical warfare agents. And it was using one of his chemistry process, the Harbour Cycle, that he was able to produce chlorine gas or mustard gas that would be later deployed during the First World War. Again, the British, not to be outdone, found their own Jewish chemist. This time his name was Wiseman. And his main objective was to make acetone. He was a chemist making the chemicals that were required for explosives, for petrol, for fuel, for ethanol that were needed for the British war effort. This man was a, a Zionist, so he believed that the Jewish people needed to gather themselves together and to make their own nation again back in Jerusalem. This is what the Zionists believed in. Wiesman, for his support of the British war effort, found himself with many political favours that were owed to him. Many believe that his contribution to the British war effort ended in the Balfour Declaration, which would present 
Israel as a nation for the Jewish people in the future. And this declaration was made through Lord Rothschild. When the First World War finished, one of the things that happened was that the British and the French cut up the Ottoman Empire and they gave portions of it to themselves. Britain chose to rule over an old land that would have once upon a time been called Israel. But the British called it British Mandate Palestine. Of course, the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem was not happy about this. He had been promised land from the British after the First World War to form an Arab nation. And now the British have gone and promised that same land to the Jewish population to form a country called Israel. And so he starts to lead a revolt of the Arabs against the British that by this point are occupying the land. The British simply didn't have a big enough army in the Arab regions of the world to fight this battle and to win successfully at the time. And so the British went through a policy of appeasement to Germany, which allowed them time to redeploy some of their troops in the Middle East to overcome the Arabs that were revolting against the British leadership over that region that they gained during the First World War. The Arabs weren't just defeated by the British, they were humiliated. Many of their homelands were blown up. Thousands of Arab men died to a much superior and much more advanced British army. The Arabs lost that desire in their belly for an Arab nation to be formed. The Grand Mufti of Jerusalem fled the region for his life. So I want to show you a little video about who the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem was. On November 20th, just three months after Hitler invades the Soviet Union, the Grand Mufti Amin al-Husseini is in Berlin, safe from British pursuit. He is welcomed to the Nazi capital by the German foreign minister, von Ribbentrop. The Mufti failed in Iraq, but he is convinced that a Nazi victory in the war will, in the end, give him everything he wants. Once again, he asks von Ribbentrop for German promises to support Arab independence. He insists that the Jews of the Middle East are part of a world conspiracy and makes it clear that he fully supports their complete annihilation. He asks von Ribbentrop for face time with Adolf Hitler. Von Ribbentrop is impressed. He agrees that the Mufti should meet Hitler in person. The Grand Mufti wanted Hitler to promise an Arab national state in the Middle East, in the ancient lands of, uh, is of Islam. And that's exactly what Hitler was willing to offer them, either quietly or openly, depending upon the nature of the context. Eight days after he is greeted in Berlin by von Ribbentrop, the Grand Mufti has his long sought after meeting with Adolf Hitler. Hitler explained to him that he would ask every people in the Middle East to deal with their Jews and to solve the Jewish problem. And it was clear what he meant. He meant to organize another Holocaust in the Middle East. With Hitler's blessing, the Grand Mufti is introduced to the chief of the SS, Heinrich Himmler. Himmler, his subordinate Adolf Eichmann, and Al Husseini become close friends. Himmler gives the Mufti the rank of Gruppenführer in the SS, the equivalent of general, and gives Amin and his followers a generous monthly allowance to set up an Arab bureau in Berlin. The Mufti was everywhere in Germany during World War II. He was parading up and down the street. He was making official visits. He was making embassy visits. He was on uh, Radio Berlin uh, nightly. Himmler puts the Mufti in charge of all Arabic broadcasting from Berlin. Over the airwaves, Al Husseini repeatedly calls for another Arab uprising against the British. He also rails against the Jews, inciting Arabs to, quote, kill the Jews wherever you find them. In all of his speeches afterwards, he would always explain 
there are three big enemies, the British, the Americans, and the Jews. He would depict America as a, the big enemy of the Arabs. The Mufti hated Jews, he hated Zionism. His goal was to destroy the Jews, kill them, before they were allowed to immigrate. In 1943, the Grand Mufti learns of plans by Hungary, Romania, and Bulgaria, countries allied to Germany, to let thousands of Jews leave for the safety of Palestine. Through his influence with Himmler and von Ribbentrop, the Mufti immediately has the programs canceled. Among the planned emigrants are 4,000 children. Their fate in Nazi-controlled Europe is almost certain death. In the last four years of war, Germany has suffered enormous casualties on the battlefield. The Reich is desperate for fighting men. Heinrich Himmler begins recruiting Muslims from the Balkans with the enthusiastic help of the Grand Mufti, Amin al-Husseini. The Mufti helps raise the Bosnian Muslim 13th SS Division Hansjar, along with other units of what the Mufti calls his Arab Legion. Altogether, the Grand Mufti helps recruit 30,000 men for the Nazi war machine. Ironically, in Nazi racial theory, Arabs are seen as inferior racial stock and not eligible for SS membership. Himmler treats foreign SS units with contempt as second-class citizens. But after an extensive physical exam for the Mufti, he makes an exception. For this, he has Hitler's approval. The personal physician of the Grand Mufti evaluated the Grand Mufti, and he said uh, he is not an Arab. He's a, he's a Caucasian, almost an Aryan. So we can expect that he will be a really reliable ally for us. The SS Division Hansjar is deployed hunting down underground resistors in Yugoslavia and acts as an internal security force in Hungary. The division is responsible for a series of atrocities against partisans and Jews. In April 1945, as Allied troops fight their way through Germany in the last battles of the war in Europe, the story of the Mufti's Muslim regiments takes one final twist. As the cataclysmic battle for Berlin rages around Hitler's bunker, among the Nazi troops making their last suicidal stand are 100 men of the Mufti's Arab Legion. With the Allied victory, the war is over. But the influence of Nazi Germany on the Middle East is far from over. In Iraq, the Grand Mufti's legacy will fan the flames of a new and potent force, one that will mold a young Arab nationalist into a cunning and brutal dictator. Even today, we can see the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem's influence within Germany, as during the First World War, the books that he had published are still in print today, and many of his books were given to the German army. As you saw in the video of the Grand Mufti, the Arab nations supported the Germans in a plea to, for them to gain their own independence. At this point, I think it's important for me to make clear that you're going to find that there were both Muslims and Arabs that fought on the side of the Germans and also on the side of the Allies during the, the Second World War. And the reason for this was the British Empire. Many of those within the British Empire felt an allegiance to Britain and went and fought wars on behalf of Britain. As a result of it, during the Second World War, people from the British Empire that were Muslim and Arabs picked up the sword, picked up their guns, and they fought against the Germans. Following the Second World War, the British government decided that they wanted to distribute the land in the way that they had promised. And they tried to come good on the promises that they'd previously made with both the Arab population 
and the Jewish community. And so they had this idea of splitting the land of the British Mandate of Palestine into two. One area for the Jewish population and one area for the Palestinian population. And this would be called the British Mandate for Palestine. And it would form both a Palestinian nation and an Israeli state for the Jewish nation. However, Jerusalem was never going to be considered either Palestinian or Israeli, and it was going to be a separate international city given to neither group of people so that anyone from any religion or from anywhere in the world had access to the holy city of Jerusalem. And this was to help prevent tensions and wars based upon three faiths, Christians, Jews, and Muslims fighting over the holy city and the holy sites of Jerusalem. So in 1948, the Jewish population of the British Mandate of Palestine declared their independence and formed Israel according to the borders that were drawn up by the British plan of Palestine in the 1948 plans. Israel was born as a nation and they did not have the city of Jerusalem or any claim to it at all. Immediately, as the Jewish people declared their independence, scuffles and fights and minor battles within that country began to erupt as the Jewish groups started to end up in battles with the Palestinian groups over the land that they were claiming. The internal battles between the Palestinian families and the Jewish families ended up leading to a number of Arab nations declaring war against the newly formed state of Israel. The Palestinian people fled from the country looking for local countries such as Jordan, such as Lebanon, such as Syria, places of safety so that they could avoid getting involved and being caught in the crossfire of the pursuing war. The Jewish population didn't have a country to flee to, so they got themselves involved in fighting this war and ensured that they had to win. The Jewish population didn't have anywhere to flee to, so it was really important for the Jews that they had to live. It was a war of survival for them. Of the refugees that were Arabs, 14% of them went into Lebanon, 10% of them went into Syria, another 10% ended up leaving and going into Jordan, 38% of all of the refugees from the British Mandate of Palestine ended up going into the West Bank, 26% of the population fled into the Gaza Strip. At this point, I think it's worth pointing out that the original intentions of Israel in 1948 was not to take the West Bank and Jerusalem or the Gaza Strip. These portions of land Israel never claimed as its own territory. And it's only a result of the attacks on Israel and them fighting and taking land as they've had to fight to defend themselves that Israel have ended up in possession of these portions of land. Talking about refugee movement, I think it's only right that we also should mention how so many Jewish people ended up in the British Mandate of Palestine to begin with. After and during the First World War, immigrants from all over the world were fleeing from Europe and the Jewish people wanted to go back to where their forefathers had been thousands of years early and so many of them left for the land of the British Mandate of Palestine to the historical land known as Israel. The net result of this was a massive Jewish increase in population that the Arabs didn't appreciate. Even before the First World War, the immigration of Jewish people back into this land was so prolific that the British Empire banned 50% of the immigration of Jews and sent them back to Europe on their boats. We don't know how many of those that were turned away died in concentration camps as a result of banning such immigration. In hindsight, it appears that the Jewish people were trying to live and they could see the coming danger that was going to occur across Europe and were fleeing for safety in the one place that they felt they could be safe. A land that would be a land of safety because the Jews could live together and protect one another, Israel. Now, I also see the Arab perspective on all this. The Arabs would have felt like the land that they were freely moving and living in was now going to be occupied partly by another nation of people that had not been there in the numbers that they were seeing immigrating across the borders and taking over portions of the land. Equally so, I think it's also important to understand that when the Israelis took the land and declared independence, that there was a number of people that became refugees from the war against Israel that became refugees that are still displaced in some part to today. 
we've seen refugee camps on both sides of the coin. I want to show you a little recap now on the Jewish War of Independence. May 14, 1948, 4 p.m. Tel Aviv. On a small podium stands a determined Zionist leader before a hastily convened gathering, reading out a proclamation which would change the course of history. This is how the state of Israel was born. First, a bit of background. At the end of World War I, the Allied powers gained control over the Middle East, including the land of Israel. The League of Nations recognized the historical connection of the Jewish people to their land and granted Great Britain a mandate to help them reconstitute a national home. However, Arab riots and geopolitical considerations led to a series of British restrictions on Jewish development and immigration. Even ships, including displaced children and the Holocaust survivors, were sent back to Europe. Jewish resistance grew as well. By 1947, the ball was back in the United Nations court, where a majority of the nations decided on November 29th, after a tense vote, to divide the land into a Jewish and an Arab state. The Jews rejoiced. The local Arab population, well, they launched a war throughout the country. May 15, 1948 was the date the British mandate officially ended, the date the Jewish state was to be declared, and the date five regular Arab armies planned a coordinated attack to annihilate the newborn state. On May 12th, David Ben-Gurion convened the People's Council. The atmosphere was grave. Moshe Sharet reported that the Americans are demanding a postponement of the declaration or else they would not help Israel against the United Arab invasion. Golda Meir reported that King Abdullah had retracted his original agreement and will join the attack. Military leaders expressed serious doubts about the ability of the small Jewish community to withstand five regular Arab armies equipped with European weaponry. But somehow, after 13 hours of deliberations, Ben-Gurion succeeds in swaying the balance against the American demand. And on Friday, May 14th, in the presence of local Jewish leaders, he declares the establishment of the State of Israel. The proclamation, which was inspired by the American Declaration of Independence, asserted the historical and moral rights of the Jewish people in its historic homeland, and defined Israel as a Jewish democratic state, based on equal rights, freedom, and justice. The declaration ended with a call on Jews to return home, and extended a hand for peace towards the local Arab population and neighboring Arab countries. The Arab invasion was immediate and lasted for over a year. Close to 50% of Israel's small fighting force were survivors of the Nazi death camps who vowed never again. One out of every hundred Jews living in Israel died in the fighting. But by the end of the war, the small Jewish state had emerged victorious as an independent nation in this homeland for the first time in 2,000 years. May 14, 1948, the British mandate in Palestine is about to expire. David Ben-Gurion proclaims the birth of the State of Israel. The next day, the five neighboring Arab countries declare war. The city of Haifa and its harbor become the center of bitter conflict as the new Jewish state is born in the tense atmosphere of civil war. During the Arab-Israeli War of 1948, more than 700,000 Palestinians are forced into exile. It's the Nakba, which means catastrophe in Arabic. Haganah forces seek out every Arab, and barricades are set up to screen those who had not already fled the city. Everyone is searched. The Haganah, a paramilitary organization, forms the core of Israeli forces and is responsible for expelling Palestinians. Some leave on their own to escape the violence. Their lands and houses are seized. Most flee to Gaza, Jordan, Lebanon, or Syria. On December 11, 1948, the United Nations adopts a resolution for the right of return for these Palestinian refugees. But Israel has never given its permission. As we look at the map, we can see the plan that the British brought to the United Nations and the United Nations signed off for Israel and Palestine according to the 1947 British plan. This is the plan that the Israeli people said we will accept and declare their independence with these borders. But by June 1948, the Arab armies had invaded and had come to war against Israel, which by the end of 1948 and the third map 
you can begin to see some of the huge portions of land that Israel had now started to attack and to take back from the Arabs that had gone to war against them. It's important to understand that Transjordan, that Egypt, that Syria, that Lebanon, that Saudi Arabia had all declared war on Israel and many other groups had lent and armies had lent its troops to these nations so that they could go to war against Israel to make one great Arab nation. However, the Arab nations waging war against Israel backfired and it meant that Israel ended up taking a lot of the land in the war that would have been given to the Palestinians to form their own nation. The build-up to the 1967 Six Day War. There was one key figure across the Middle East and across the Arab nations that seemed to be a unifying force and his name was Gamal Nasser. He was seen as a leader of the Arab world and a revolutionary. He at this point was fighting to be seen as the leader of the Arab world and to take the dominant force in these countries and one day perhaps to unify the Arab nations of the world under his leadership. And he makes this quote, I believe that we have a duty to remove the aggressor from our land and to regain the Arab territory occupied by the Israelis. We can then engage in a clandestine struggle to liberate the land of Palestine, to liberate the Hafa and Jaffa. Another quote that he's famous for saying goes like this. The armies of Egypt, Jordan, Syria, Lebanon are poised on the borders of Israel to face the challenge. While standing behind us are the armies of Iraq, Algeria, Kuwait, Sudan and the whole of the Arab nation. This act will astound the world. Today they will know that the Arabs are arranged for battle. The critical hour has arrived. We have reached the stage of serious action and not of more declarations. And Nasir also said this too. We will not accept any coexistence with Israel. Today, the issue is not the establishment of peace between the Arab state and Israel. The war with Israel is won in effect since 1948. Unfortunately, the 1948 war wasn't the only one and the Arabs were trying to unify as one great Arab nation again. And at this point, Nasir was the leader over Egypt and other Arab nations came in support of him and looked to him as a, as a leader. He already had this history of very strong tone and rhetoric against the Jews that had formed their own nation of Israel. He ends up getting a report from foreign, from Russian intelligence officers saying that Israel plans to attack. So he sends a huge proportion of his army to his border with Israel. Other nations across the Middle East get wind of this and the people in the Middle East start to celebrate that someone has finally come to do what they couldn't do in 1948 and that is to push the Jews into the sea to use the rhetoric that was being used then and is still sometimes used today. Other leaders of Arab nations felt that they had to get involved otherwise their populations would turn against them so they lent their armies to to this man, Nasir, to go and fight against the Israelis. There was still one glimmer of hope, and it was that there was a United Nations peacekeeping force on the border between Israel and Egypt that separated them from these opposing armies, and so there couldn't be an accidental gunshot that kills someone that triggers a war. What, does, what happens now? Nasir asks the United Nations peacekeeping troops and forces to move out the way and he tells them that he no longer requires their presence in the area. The troops between Egypt and Israel are removed and also the troops and on boats that guard the Straits of Taiwan, they also move. The result is that Israel and their Prime Minister buy for time and they say that this isn't a declaration of war, we don't want war but they move a small contingent of men down to their border to protect themselves. Israel does, however, make it very clear at this point that any closing of the international shipping waters from Israel would be, in effect, a trigger of war because it would cut them off from both land and sea, having access to other countries and to trade. It was suffocation by any other means. 
because by this point Israel is surrounded by all the Arab nations around it that are about to declare war and closing the water and the ports and the international sea routes to Israel was paramount to saying that we're going to cut you off and we're going to starve you to death. The Israeli Prime Minister very smartly says that closing the straits of water for international movement of boats from Israel would be an act of war. More and more Arab leaders publicly go on record saying they support any war of Arabs against the Jewish people. And then finally, the straits and these international waters are closed to Israeli shipping. Israel initially pleaded for America to get involved and to help them, but America were unwilling to get involved in another war. This results in the Six Day War in 1967, where Israel fight against these Arab nations around it. And again, it ends up taking a huge portion of lands and winning the war. Israel acted preemptively, which means that the Arab nations didn't fire any shots. But what the Arab nations had done was encircle them and cut off their supply of international trade and commerce. The previous week, Egypt had moved 80,000 troops, 550 tanks, and 1,000 artillery pieces into the Sinai, the buffer zone between Egypt and Israel, and expelled the UN force intended to keep the peace. Israel began defensive preparations, but sought international diplomacy to avert the crisis. Prime Minister Levi Eshkol stated that Israel would not initiate hostilities unless Egyptian forces closed the international waterway leading to Israel's southern port. Its closure would shut down Israel's supply of oil and other vital resources and block access of Israeli ships to the east. On May 23rd, President Nasser did just that and blockaded the Straits of Tehran leading to the Gulf of Aqaba and cutting off shipping to Israel's southern port of Eilat. This action violated UN Security Council Resolution 118, was condemned by US President Johnson, and constituted a casus belli, an internationally recognized act of war. Yet Israel restrained from taking any military action, still preferring a diplomatic solution to the conflict. But from Nasser's statements and from public opinion of the Arab masses inflamed with the prospect of destroying Israel, it seemed that a diplomatic solution was not going to be an option. We knew that closing the Gulf of Aqaba meant war with Israel. If war comes, it will be total and the objective will be Israel's destruction. Five other Arab countries rallied around Nasser and sent their troops to the front lines. War seemed imminent. <laughs> والجيش العربي جيش واحد ولن يفرق بيننا الاستعمار أو أعوان الاستعمار. The 1967 Six Day War is referred to by Arabs as the Nakba, the setback. It was a humiliating defeat for Arab powers and a major victory for Israel. It marked the beginning of 50 years of occupation of Jerusalem, the West Bank, Gaza, and the Golan Heights in Syria radically reshaping the destiny of the Middle East. On May 13, 1967, Soviet intelligence informed Egypt that Israeli forces were building up near the Syrian border. The following day, the symbol of Arab nationalism, Egyptian President Gamal Abdel Nasser, ordered 130,000 Egyptian troops to move into the Sinai Peninsula along Israel's borders. The intent was to prevent an invasion of Syria rather than to attack Israel. As tensions escalated on May 16, Nasser ordered the withdrawal of UN peacekeeping forces from Sinai. Six days later, the Egyptian president closed the Tehran Straits, blocking ships from entering Israel's port of Ilet. Confident of their military superiority, Egyptian and Arabs celebrated Abdel Nasser's actions. What they didn't know was that Israel's army was better equipped and ready for war. In Israel, the media compared the Arabs to the Nazis, triggering memories of the Holocaust and fueling anti-Nasser sentiments. Fearing war, US President Lyndon Johnson warned both sides not to be the first to strike. The Egyptian-led Arab powers, fearing a US invasion, stood down. To their surprise, on June 5th at 7.45 a.m., the well-rehearsed Israeli aerial assault, Operation Focus, kicked off. By midday on June 5th, 200 Israeli jets 
had struck 18 Egyptian airfields, destroying more than 80% of the country's air force, before they even managed to get off the ground. However, Cairo made fake announcements claiming an Egyptian victory to rally its Arab neighbors to join the war effort. Syria, Jordan and Iraq followed suit and started deploying their air forces to strike Israeli targets. But on the same day, Israel quickly destroyed all of their airfields as well, achieving complete air superiority. Despite not having any air support, the Egyptian soldiers held their defenses in Sinai against the Israeli incursion. Meanwhile, Jordan, under the leadership of King Hussein, had started a small offensive and had reached the hills overlooking southern Jerusalem. But by June 6th, Egyptian Field Marshal Abdel Hakim Amr, having witnessed the might of Israel's air force, ordered the full retreat of Egypt's army from Sinai. Jordan, realizing the severity of Egypt's humiliating retreat, decided to pull back from its positions after minor clashes with the Israelis. By Wednesday, June 7th, Israel had successfully taken over the Jordanian-administered East Jerusalem and West Bank. By the fourth day of the war, Israel had reached the Suez Canal with full control of the Egyptian-administered Gaza Strip and the entire Sinai Peninsula. Having demolished the Jordanian and Egyptian armies, Syria was now on its own. On the fifth day of the war, Israel ascended the strategic Golan Heights. Syrian soldiers fought the Israeli forces. However, similar to their Egyptian allies, they were let down by the decisions of their leaders. Hafez al-Assad, then defense minister, accepted a UN ceasefire, undermining the ongoing military resistance. By the sixth day of the war, Israel accepted the UN ceasefire as well. But the damage had been done, and the Middle East would never be the same. Israel tripled in size. Arab armies and nationalism were crippled as a broken Egyptian president tried to resign in shame. فإنني على استعداد لتحمل المسؤولية كلها ولقد اتخذت قرارا أريدكم جميعا أن تساعدوني عليه لقد قررت أن أتنحى تماما ونهائيا عن أي منصب رسمي وأي دور سياسي وأن أعود إلى صفوف الجماهير وأدي واجبي معها كأي مواطن آخر Israel had proved its superiority and its army created a mythical aura propelled by Arab leaders trying to hide their failures. Israel had gained administration of one million Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza. Israeli settlements in the West Bank were built with more settlements in Egypt, Sinai and Syria's Golan Heights also under construction. Israel, taking advantage of Arab weakness, was not willing to give up its gains, using religious justification for their occupation of the lands. With its newfound power, Israel refused to comply with the international community. Palestinians had realized Arab powers could not protect them and went on to create their own national liberation movements that also failed to achieve their desired goal. Ultimately, the Six-Day War scarred the Arab psyche, paving the way for an overzealous Israeli leadership. And to this day, border issues remain unresolved. Now, the reason that this history is so important to us is because we need to t understand the spirit behind it. I'm not saying that Israel were right about every battle and every bloodshed and everything that they fought but they were fighting to protect themselves whereas the Arab nations were fighting to try and regain land when in fact there were plenty of other Arab nations at the time that could have been willing to take the people into their countries and protect them and to keep them alive. The Jews had literally escaped Europe thinking that they were going to be utterly wiped out and annihilated and they chose to go to Israel thinking it would be a place of safety where they could gather together. And they found that actually the Arab nations of the world didn't want them there and were willing to wipe Jews off the face of the world in order for that land to be Arab land. It's quite interesting. The Jews taking over this land saw a number of improvements. We see the land and the irrigation of water, water being changed from salt water in the sea into regular fresh water that could be used for drinking or for the watering of crops. And we start to see Israel begin to flourish into an agricultural center, which is able to grow green foods across the world. In contrast, the Palestinians were not able to do the same thing. And so if you go into the Gaza Strip, you will find that the Palestinians don't even have access to fresh water and rely on the Israelis to pump water to them. So let us keep moving forward in history. The rise of Fatah and Hamas. After 1967, we start to see groups forming such as the PLO and Fatah. The PLO stands for the Palestinian Liberation organization and it's led up by none other than Yasser Arafat. 
who is actually a relative of the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem and he wants to fight for Palestinians to have the land and for Israel to disappear. The PLO is the military branch of Fatah which is a political organisation and the PLO acted out many terrorist attacks upon the Jewish Israeli population. Sadly to me, the IRA and the PLO got along like a house on fire because of their common enemy in the British. And the PLO seemed to believe that the British were responsible for forming this Jewish Israeli state. But in fact, Britain had just given land to the Palestinian people that lived there and to the Jewish people that lived in that land. Hoping that the two could live together in peace after Britain withdrew from the land. You could be forgiven for thinking that just one side of the political spectrum of Palestine would be extreme. You know, the PLO and Fatah, they want to kill the Jews and wipe them into the sea. You could be forgiven in thinking that's just one side of politics. Well, let's have a look at the opposite side of politics, which is Hamas. Right now, you can see the Hamas leader. And just notice something in common when we look through all these pictures of the Hamas leader. That's right, all of the pictures that you ever see of the Hamas leader are always with him being surrounded or holding children. And there's a reason for this. He knows that within Hamas, he's probably one of the only people that would be a legitimate military target. And so he's constantly surrounding himself by small children to show that the children are the next generation and the children are exactly what he's going to hide behind. Hamas went to great lengths to train their own children to hate the Jewish state and the Jewish people. You will often notice that Hamas are literally launching rockets or doing their military exercises in front of the children of Palestine so that they can see what's going on and become a part of it and can become the heroes to the next generation to fight against the Jews. Even as explosives are being laid, Palestinian children watch on sympathetic to this struggle. They're being trained to hate and to want to kill the Jews. Sadly, images of suicide bombers and also children suicide bombers can be seen coming out of Hamas. So now we can see that we've got Fatah or the PLO and Hamas, which are the two political organizations within Palestine. Within the West Bank, you will find that the PLO and Yasser Arafat were the people that were in power. Whereas in the Gaza Strip, originally it was the PLO and the People's Liberation Army. But it later shifts to Hamas and Hamas were the Islamic led group that were far more violent with their means. Within the Hamas Charter, it has down that they wish to wipe Israel off the face of the earth. And so please don't tell me that everywhere in Palestine and everyone in Palestine thinks the same thing on this conflict. That's not the case at all. All Palestinians seem to want peace. But within the West Bank and Gaza, there are two very different groups. The West Bank, where Jerusalem is, you might find a bit of agitation around the religious areas and around the Temple Mount. You might find dispute from time to time. But what we don't see, particularly in the West Bank, is the rocket fire that you're probably going to see from Hamas and the Gaza Strip, which is governed by Hamas. There's two different thoughts about how the people should take back the land or how they should fight for freedom and how they should live amongst a Jewish population. It's very interesting that when you go to the West Bank, you will find in the most part, both Jews and Palestinians living together. But when you go into the Gaza Strip, you are in a very anti-Jewish place, which is predominantly run by anti-Semitic and anti-Israel Palestinian groups. If you want to understand some of the more recent events in Palestine, have a look at the timing to when the wars and the battles and the rockets and the, the, the fights have been, you will find that they seem to centre around Jewish religious days, Muslim religious days or elections. And this seems to be the theme of all the major crises. It's no surprise that the last events that we saw in 2021 
happened at around the same time that they were preparing for elections, which would have meant that one of those two powers, either Hamas or Fatah, would have been able to go to the ballot box and win control over the whole of Palestine. And every time there seems to be an election, there seems to be a reason for conflict and to make it unsafe for the ballot box to rule across Palestine. And it's just an observation that I'm making. The net result is for the last 15 years, Palestine has not been able to elect officials to posts. And unfortunately, political support for terrorist acts has increased the number of terrorist acts going on in the region. Another wrong that the Jewish population of Israel did was that they started to take revenge. Whence there had been a number of mass bombings, suicide bombers and mass killings, the Jewish people wanted revenge and they took it with their own hands. This is forbidden by the Old Testament and by the Jewish Bible. The Bible is clear that only the Lord our God is to be the avenger of people. The place of government is to bring justice and to try and restore order and fairness to society, not to take revenge for people that have done great wrongs. But the Israeli, like the British and the American Special Forces, Mossad, which is the Israeli Special Forces, often go into foreign territories and take revenge, killing agents of war, killing people that have done them wrong. And there's a very famous case where the Hamas leader was actually poisoned by two Ham by two Mossad agents that went in and poisoned him. And it got so bad that one of the neutral countries, Jordan at this point, 
whose king had only ever tried to make peace in the Middle East. He's begging America to put pressure on Israel for the antidote for the poison that's been administered to this man to be released. Now, don't get me wrong. The Hamas leader here was a terrorist who had killed hundreds of Jews through bombings and appointed people to the killing of Jewish people and the killing of Israelis. But it was out of order for the Jews and for Mossad to start avenging themselves in foreign nations, killing people without due process. And this is something that we've seen in a number of Western powers, whether it be Britain with the SAS, whether it be America with their CIA or with their special intelligence services that have killed people illegally. And when it happens, they deny that it ever occurred and they deny that they ever had any involvement. These sorts of killings are completely unjust according to the scriptures. And in one essence, you could argue that it's state-sponsored or government-sponsored terrorism. And this is the place where Israel, like America and like Britain, can get themselves into a bit of hot water politically because they are acting out as terrorists, doing their own vengeance and killing to put fear in the hearts of those that oppose their government system. You see, it's important that we understand that it's not just terrorists that use fear to control the actions of others. Governments are also involved with this too, even those established governments that are recognised by the United Nations. Terrorist to peacemaker. Yasser Arafat went from a man who was a leader of a terrorist organisation to a man that would later win the Nobel Peace Prize because he realised that Israel was willing to trade bits of land for peace. Egypt, the whole of the Sinai Peninsula, and regained it again from Israel for signing a peace treaty with them. Syria, they regained the land that Israel had taken for peace. And so Yasser for Arafat regains political control over parts of the West Bank and Gaza in agreement that he would allow peace in Israel. It also later puts him at odds with the Palestinian people that want the war that they've been raised up believing is the way to solve the conflict. I'm glad that today there are many people within Palestine that see that if they continue to act in the way of previous generations, then they're probably going to end up with the same results. Peace in the Middle East is going to be the result of people wanting peace rather than to destroy their enemies. On the screen right now, you can see Prime Minister Rabin shaking the hands of Yasser Arafat in front of Bill Clinton. This gave Yasser Arafat political power to make decisions in portions of the land in Palestine. And the Israelis were willing to devolve power and to allow this man to lead. And this was signed into agreement through the Oslo Accords. It wasn't long before an Israeli citizen goes out and shoots and assassinates his own Prime Minister because the Prime Minister Rabin had signed a peace treaty and this young Israeli student didn't agree with the idea of peace with his Arab Palestinians that he felt were terrorists and wanted to kill him. Wearing a white bulletproof vest, the student who tried to kill the Middle East peace process was back at the scene of his crime. Protected by heavy security, Yigal Amir retraced the steps that ended in the death of his country's Prime Minister. But this time, the weapon he was given was a harmless toy. And this time, his every move was watched by police and by an angry crowd of onlookers. Witnesses commented on how coolly Amir performed his role and detailed the events of 11 nights earlier. The Munich massacre and terrorism any place in the world. The 1970s, this battle and this disaster between Israel and Palestine doesn't get any better. In fact, something happened in Munich at the Olympics, the Munich massacre it's become known as in the Western world, which is quite startling. It wasn't enough for the Palestinian battle to kill Israeli people in Israel, but they went as far as to go all the way to Germany at the Olympic Games as a result of it, a number of hijackers climbed over the, the security fences in Germany. The Germans didn't want to seem too strong on security after the whole Nazis and the Second World War. And so they deliberately were light on their priest presence 
so that people could feel safe and not intimidated in Germany. Unfortunately, this backfired as the Arabs broke in and these Palestinians started to kill, castrate, break bones and chop up parts of the Israeli Olympic team while still in the hotel. The German police, wearing tracksuits, carrying guns, broke in and tried to break up this hostage situation. Unfortunately, because of the Olympics, everything was being broadcast live all over the world. So as all the hostage takers needed to do was turn on the TV and they could see the movements of the police from outside. The Israeli Prime Minister refused to negotiate with hostage takers like this. And so the German police went in. You can see now an image of the hotel room after the hostage takers had left. The hostage takers asked for a helicopter so that they could escape, not feeling comfortable with what the police were doing. The police ended up taking them on a helicopter and taking them to another place. And when they got out of that helicopter, the police were surrounding them and were ready to attack them. At this point, the hostage takers picked up their grenades and threw them at the helicopter where the remaining Israeli athletes that were still alive were, blowing up the helicopter and killing the remaining Israeli athletes. The Munich massacre was a strange event for the Olympic Games. The Olympic flag was flown at half-mast and the Olympic organisation decided to ask all of the nations of the world to lower their masts to half-mast as a sign of respect to commemorate those that had died in the Munich massacre. However, 11 of the Arab nations refused and so the Olympic Commission decided that no one's flags should be lowered to half-mast to not make an example of the nations that refused to lower their master half mask to commemorate Israelis that had been killed through a terrorist attack. Even today, the Olympic Association have been very reluctant to commemorate those that lost their lives during the Munich massacre during the Olympic Games. The new era of terrorism. On the screen right now, you can see footage of the ruins of Palestine as a result of the Israeli airstrikes in counter response to acts of terrorism. Countless men, women and children and the Palestinian side have lost their lives. Many of them will have been innocent civilians caught in the wrong place at the wrong time. Unfortunately, even today, Hamas and other terrorist groups that function from Palestine continue their fight from built up residential areas firing rockets that have been given to them by foreign sources, namely Iran. Unfortunately, the result is that when Israel begins to fight back and blow up the areas that have been used to fire military weapons, these are often densely populated places within the Gaza Strip. Countless children have lost their lives, or what's probably more difficult for me to personally see, are the number of orphans that have been left knowing that their fathers were killed by the hands of the Israeli people growing up with more hate and resentment. In more recent years, terror attacks have taken a new form. Israeli citizens find themselves being run over, being knived, gunned, or even facing suicide bombers. As a result of this, Israel have decided to build walls to surround the Palestinian populations so that terrorists are not able to get to Israeli citizens easily. On the flip side, these wars have meant that the Arab populations are often unable to get to work in the predominantly Jewish areas without queuing and going through military style checkpoints that queues can go on for hours. Barbed wire, concrete and electric fences are what you to expect as well as Israeli guards that are armed with live rounds and guns. The Israeli police can turn someone away for whatever reason they see fit which may lead to many people unable to take home money for their families. The inability to move across Palestine and the checkpoints have also caused turmoil to Palestinians. Imagine living in a country where you're not able to go from A to B simply. Everywhere you go, there's a military checkpoint where you could be denied entry for any given reason. This is something that the Palestinians are having to face. They're constantly having to apply for visas to go places where many other countries you would not require to do anything. And there's a one complaint that constantly is being made that Palestinians are denied access to the same things illegally. Or maybe for Palestinians it's more difficult to access it. 
the same court system and the same legal systems as in Israel. The Israeli Defence Force are also accused of being quite brutal and aggressive towards Palestinians. There is politics behind it, there is a sense of pride, there is a sense that this land used to belong to us and it doesn't anymore. There's a whole generation, in fact, there are more people that have been born in the Gaza Strip now than what were refugees originally expelled from Israel or fled from Israel during the Nakba when they were afraid of the Israeli forces killing them. The Palestinians originally thought that the Israeli people were going to kill all the Palestinians that lived within Israel, but that hasn't been the case whatsoever. Once the Israelis start to gain territories from the lands that had been captured or even annexed, one of the things that's illegal to do by international law is to build houses or settlements for your own civilian population to be able to live in the land that you've captured in war and conflict. It's not permitted to do by international law. But Israel have been funding settlements of its own people to go and live there because they feel that this land is theirs. However, international law doesn't recognise it and you are always in the wrong when you're planting your own people in a land that's not actually owned by yourself. However, it gets a bit more complicated than this. You need to understand that when Israel first became a nation, in fact, before it became a nation, many of the Jews were buying land in Jerusalem for a simple purpose, so that they could buy the land before and hoping that one day it could become a Jewish nation. The Jewish people originally thought that they could buy the land of Jerusalem, they could buy the land of Israel, and by buying lots of pieces of land that one day they could own the whole nation. And so when these wars broke out and the British mandate lines were drawn and Palestine had one section and Israel had another section of the land to form a state, many Israelis lost their land that was now given over to the Palestinians. When the Jewish army and the IDF occupied this land, many of the landowners returned to their land to find Palestinians had built on their land or were living in their properties. And so the eviction process began to evict people from a land that was owned by another, that had been taken over by a government that United Nations had drawn division lines that had separated some of the Israelis from the land that they owned. Palestinians claim that land, rightly so, by the United Nations declaration that that was their land and began to build on it. But when Jews, Jewish settlers and the Jewish army retook the land, they felt that the land that they purchased should be their own and the Jewish courts uphold these kinds of decisions. And so there's an international mess that's been going on for a long time. There's a lot of rights for refugees and for asylum seekers and there's a lot of rights for people, but when it comes to property, international law isn't very good at dealing with these kind of disputes, especially when nations and the United Nations have been involved in distribution of land. This is the reason why the Jewish IDF have been evicting people and Jewish courts have been making decisions to evict people. It's very difficult and complicated and I'm not sure it's ever right to make a person homeless again, if anything, the Israeli court should have been aiming to compensate people. But Israel, of course, want the land of Jerusalem back for themselves. They want their holy sites and they want to be close to the holy mountain and the temple mount and the place where the temple would be rebuilt. Not to mention that the land in Jerusalem and in the occupied territories is oftentimes much cheaper than the land elsewhere within Israel. And so the land itself is a very complicated battle when one person's owned it, when another person's invaded and taken over it, and then when that land has been reinvaded again and captured and restored back to Israel, who owns it and what are the legal rights for the land? Is Israel and Palestine a fair fight? I hear a lot of people complaining that the battle between Israel and Palestine isn't a fair fight. And obviously in recent years, Israel has really advanced with its military. You only have to look at the Iron Dome missile defense system. Israel will spend hundreds of millions each year on this missile defense system to protect itself as a nation. That's money that Palestine couldn't possibly afford to spend. But on the flip side of the coin, you have to make the argument 
Should Israel not spend money on its defense when the Palestinian forces are being given weapons by Iran and by other countries within the world to attack Israel? And is it wrong for Israel to spend money to defend itself to the teeth against threats of terror and fear from other nations? I don't feel that it is wrong. I think it's unfortunate that the average Palestinian isn't involved with launching rockets into Israel and provoking a war. But I feel that governments have got to do more to deal with the internal terrorism within its own borders and the attacks on other nations that are going to promote and prompt an international response, a response from another nation. Unfortunately, in the midst of this, Palestinians are the ones that lose out so greatly with their densely populated living quarters and spaces within Gaza. And in particular, Israelis also, a lot of their homes are now being built with bomb shelters. They've come to live expecting to be threatened by the neighboring cities and by the neighboring state of Palestine. It's wrong in so many levels, but I don't believe that taking away Israel's right to defend itself through whatever means that it's developed over the years to best protect it is going to take away this conflict. Defensive measures aren't the problem in my eyes. It's the fact that there are weapons being distributed across both sides that are going to be used as offensive attacks to kill people where the problem is. And so no, I haven't got a problem with Israel having a defense force and having a huge budget that they spend to protect themselves. My bigger concern is those players in the world that are giving weaponry to terrorist groups that are attacking Israel and that are prompting Israel to be very heavy handed with their military response on a very unprotected Palestinian state. Is Israel and Palestine a religious war between Jews and Muslims? Many people tell me that this is a religious war and you don't need to go into the history of this conflict. Well, I wanna say something to begin with. I'm gonna go through the history, sh shedding light on both sides. I sympathize greatly with the Palestinians being the underdogs at this present moment in time in the conflict. Although the Arab people that the Palestinians evolved from originally, I don't believe were underdogs in their first circumstances. And it's unfortunate that how it's played out where they have become the victims of a battle that they started against the Jewish population that were not trying to kill them. The reason that I wanna go through the religious context of it is I want you to understand maybe some of the spirits or the spiritual side to this conflict that can easily be glazed over by history. Although history that you will see in a moment will explain to you the religious connotations to it and you will understand some of the spirit behind why people are doing it, that sense of pride in their religion or in their nationality or their ethnic identity is very important in this conflict. On the map that you can see on the screen right now, we can see Syria in the green. We can see in the pink color, we can see Jordan. In the orange, we've got Saudi Arabia and the yellow, we've got Egypt. Between those countries, you will see a blue color. That country there is Israel. And the orange blobs within that country are called Palestine. These are the boundaries that we recognize as Israel today. However, if we zoom out a little and we look at what the Bible says Israel will be, you'll notice that Israel is a lot bigger and it's all in black on this map. This is the picture of Israel biblically in the future. And the Bible says this about it. On that day, the Lord God made a covenant with Abraham saying, to your offspring, I will give this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates, to the land of the Kenites and the Kenites and the Kadamites and the Hivites and the Pezrites and the Raphraim and the Amorites and the Canaanites and the Gigarites and the Jebusites. It's interesting to notice that according to the scripture, God's going to give Israel a land, the descendants of Abraham, a land that's between the river Nile and the great river Euphrates. This is a much bigger portion of land than what Israel ever had in the Bible. That's important to understand that. The River Jordan was oftentimes one of the boundaries of Israel, but now it's not gonna be a boundary. It'd be the River Nile in Egypt to the River Euphrates that goes through Syria. Now in the Bible, we also read about God telling the children of Israel to take and to possess the land as follows. 
Turn and take your journey and go to the hill country of the Amorites and to all their neighbours in Arabah, in the hill country and in the lowlands of the Negab, by the, and by the sea coasts, the land of the Canaanites and Lebanon as far as the great river, the river Euphrates. I see, I have set the land before you. Go in and take possession of the land that the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac and to Jacob and give to them and to their offspring after them. God encourages the children of Israel to go in and to take possession of a land where other nations were before them. In the Bible, the Jewish people were told to possess the land and to drive out the inhabitants of the land. Now, this is not something that I see happening in the Israeli conflict right now. So both the Jewish and the Old Testament for the Christians has commands about taking possession of the land by force. However, this is not something that we are witnessing the Jewish country of Israel do at this present moment in time whatsoever. In fact, if anything, they've given away just as much land as they've taken in grounds of making peace treaties with other nations so that they, they don't feel threatened or attacked. Ezekiel 48 shows us a picture of Israel in the future being much larger than what it currently is or much larger than it's ever been at any time in history and each of the colour bands on Israel here is owned by one tribe of Israel. Notice that these colour bands go all the way down through Egypt. Now in the Bible, you're probably thinking, so maybe God overpromised the children of Israel. Well, in the Bible, there was a man named King David. Now King David's quite famous and quite well known. Let's have a read about what he does in the scriptures. David also defeated Hadazah, king of Zoeb Hamath, as he went to set up his monument at the river Euphrates. David actually had to go and fight to get to the river Euphrates to set up this monument. Why has he done that? Because he understands this is a part of the land that God said that his people, Israel, should have. And so David goes up there to fight for it, believing fully in his heart that this land belongs to him. The difficulty that we have within Christianity, Islam and Judaism is that all three of them declare themselves to be the religion of Abraham and the prophets. And so all three would make this claim to the land. Now, interestingly, in the modern sense, and I will talk about this a little bit more later on in this video, but in the modern sense of Jerusalem, the world wants Jerusalem to be an international city that was given to neither Israel or the Palestinians, but it was meant to be an international city so that everyone in the world can access it. In the book of Revelations, the Bible says this, the great city was split into three parts and the cities of the nations fell and God remembered Babylon the Great to make her drain the cup of wine of the fury of his wrath. In the Bible, the great city is Jerusalem and what's really interesting about the description of the great city Jerusalem here is that the Bible says it will be split up into three parts and it, the city of the nations will fall the international city of the nations was this dream of Israel being for all the nations of the world as this international city and it fell and it's been split up into three parts. Right now Israel looks like it's in four parts. You've got the Christian quarter, you've got the Muslim quarter, you've got the Armenian quarter and you've got the Jewish quarter. But if we look a little bit more closely at these quarters you're going to notice that in the ch Christian quarter you've got the Church of the Holy Scepter. In the Armenian quarter, you've got St. James's Church. The Armenians would identify themselves as Christian. So in one essence, you have half of the city of Jerusalem being given over to the Christians. Then you've got the Muslim quarter and the Jerusalem, the Jewish quarter. And so the city of Jerusalem is split in three, Christian, Muslim and Jewish in exactly the way that the book of Revelation speaks about it. And the, the city is of the nations, Jerusalem being the city for all nations, that idea has fallen. It's interesting that the end times predictions about Israel can be played out on what's happening right now on the city of Jerusalem. But I promise you this, Christians and Jews are not fighting for the biblical picture of the future of Israel, with its, with its humongous borders at this present moment in time. And even if Christians were to fight for Jerusalem, 
we would fight for it by winning people's hearts and minds to the faith, not by conquering, not by war. Within Islam, Jerusalem is considered to be a holy city. In fact, it's the third holy city in Islam, the third holy place, after Mecca and Medina. And it's because that the prophets had lived there previously, so it's a hallowed and a sacred place to Muslims. In fact, there is a story about Muhammad the prophet going on a journey from Medina all the way through six stops and ends up at the temple, at the Dome of the Rock in Jerusalem on the Temple Mount. And from there, the Muslims believe that he ascended up into heaven and ended up speaking with Allah, speaking to many prophets along the way upon this journey. And so it's a revered and sacred land to Muslims as well. For the Jews, Jerusalem is a holy city because it's a city of David. It was the city where the temple of God was to be built and where it is going to be built again if they ever get the land. The Jewish people are so passionate about their temple. Now you have to understand this. In the Jewish context and understanding, you need a temple or an altar to make sacrifices to God, to take away your sins so that you can be washed clean before God. And so the Jews want nothing more than to sacrifice their lambs and their cows so that they can make themselves pure before God. However, the temple was destroyed 2000 years ago by the Romans in 70 AD. And as a result of this, for 2000 years, Jews have not been able to make sacrifices that would be pleasant and pleasing to their God. As a result of this today, many Jews have began to make the vessels and the articles and have drawn up plans for the temple to be rebuilt in expectation of Israel being once more given the land in the future. Israel may be, the Jewish population of Israel may be preparing to rebuild a temple, but they're waiting to be given the land or to have access to it. They're not trying to demolish a Jewish site to build up their own holy site on that same spot. I'll say that again, the Jews are not trying to destroy a Muslim holy site to rebuild their holy site. They're looking to be given the land, but they are making preparations. They're practicing the slaughter of animals. They're growing the red heifer. They're making more and more animals that are without spot and blemish that would be acceptable before their religious teachings. So Jerusalem is a city that is a hotspot for Christians, Muslims and Jews. One of the things that I don't agree with what the Jews did, but I understand why they did it, was when they finally took control of Jerusalem, they went to their most sacred spot, which was the Wailing Wall. And you need to understand the Wailing Wall was a very narrow passage. There was actually another wall next to it. So it was just an alleyway where few Jews could go and begin to pray at that very famous site. One of the things that the Jewish people did was when they took control of the area, they knocked down the houses and the walls adjacent to it and opened up a huge square so that hundreds of thousands of people could go and pray at the site of the Wailing Wall. No longer would it be a restrictive area where only a couple of people could go in at a time, but it became a mass area that all Jewish people could come to this Wailing Wall and have mass Jewish celebrations and prayers. Of course, this was at the detriment of the houses of the Palestinian people that were living in that region at the time and many Arabs would have been displaced because of this simple move. One of the greatest difficulty with this conflict is the fact that everyone has some very valid points that are always stated but you've got to sit down and ask the question what is the loving and the right thing to do in difficult circumstances? As any time that Christians have sin and the difficulties of sin are exposed, there is a time where we've got to pray, we've got to repent, and we've got to ask God to lead us. And in this conflict, I feel like everyone's making arguments about what they want, but there's not enough people asking God, what is the right thing to do in this situation? Laws and international laws are never going to solve the crises that happen within people's lives that are oftentimes very complex and very complicated. My question has got to be, what can you do to love your neighbour so that you can treat your enemy the same way that you would like to be treated yourself? This is the solution for the Israel-Palestine conflict. Ultimately, biblically, one of the final solutions is maybe the Lord Jesus Christ's return is going to be the end of this conflict 
then maybe he's going to rule with a rod of justice that neither side can get away with acting badly. The bottom line is that I know that this controversy and some of the things that I've said here might have been very difficult, but I am pointing out the faults and the strengths of the arguments of both sides. The right to return should apply to both Jews and Palestinians throughout all ages, regardless of whether you're the first generation or the 400th generation exiled away from your land. Both of these communities are using the right to return as a justification for feeling that they have the ownership of this land. Both of these groups argue that scripturally, that they are the descendants of Abraham and this land has been given to them and is the land of their prophets. Both of these groups argue that the Holy Lands belong to their culture. But I ask more than this, are you loving the way that God would ask you to love? And for the Jewish population, I believe that there's more required of them because it's very clear in the Jewish scriptures about how we're to treat our neighbours and our enemies. But there's also that difficulty about should the Jewish people be permitted by their religious teachings to drive out other inhabitants of the land? And when they do drive them out, are they to utterly destroy them? Do the scriptures use language that's expressive and symbolic and exaggerating when it says drive them out the land? Is it speaking about utterly destroying and killing them? Or is it speaking of them going and being scattered to the nations and making their home elsewhere in exactly the same fashion? That the Jews were scattered from their land, were driven out by the Romans and made their homes elsewhere across the world. Maybe it was never about killing your enemies. Maybe it was always about you taking the land for yourself and, and causing those people to live elsewhere. Being a refugee in immigration is something that's natural in society and there's nothing intrinsically evil about it, although it sometimes it can feel very harsh when someone else has got a land or a piece of property that you want for yourself. And I certainly feel that jealousy is a theme within the Middle East conflict. Israel returning to the land provoked an Arab nation to jealousy of the idea that they could lose out to a very small portion of this land if I'm totally honest, when you look at the size of the Middle East. And a small Jewish nation being formed in the Middle East was enough to provoke jealousy from the Arab nations of the world. There's so much more that I feel that I could say on this crisis, but I'm going to stop. But I invite you to put your comments down below. Please be kind and be nice. I've not been one-sided on this as far as I view it. And I am trying to look at both sides of the argument. I am sympathetic to both sides of this struggle. You can probably hear a slight bias towards Israel in me. And that's probably because I'm constantly being exposed to the Israeli side of the argument because of my faith. But I also want you to understand that I am very open to hear the cries and the hardships of the Palestinians and the Arab side of this argument. And we need to be open and honest about where we're coming from and how we're biased because one of the things that really annoys me when I hear people talk about this crisis is their political or their religious bias taken to such an extreme that oftentimes they don't know huge portions of the history of this conflict. Now I have done my best to truncate key events and key people but obviously I've not mentioned the first Suez Canal War involving the British and the French as well. I didn't touch it. I obviously haven't mentioned any of the 1972 war. I haven't mentioned anything about what was going on in 1982 and 1984. There were other major conflicts and other major events that I haven't even began to touch when I discuss this conflict. I've spoken briefly about the religious significance of this, but ultimately, I know that people are gonna make up their own minds and their own decision. I just wanted to spend a little bit of time presenting a brief outline of some of the drama and the history of the Israel-Palestine conflict. Should religions fight this out? No. I don't think it's a religious fight at all. I do believe that Israel will one day be gathered together as a nation, and I do believe that one day they'll be given a whole lot more of the land but I think that's gonna come by the supernatural hand of God and maybe by the return of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And that's not gonna take the might 
and the strength of the IDF or the hand of man, but it will be the hand of God when he uses his angels to gather his elect from the four corners of the world and when he returns them again back to this land of Israel and rebuilds and restores the kingdom of God and rules and reigns for a thousand years. I think there's going to be a whole lot more that are going to come out of Israel in the future. And so that's my stance as a Christian. Guys, please do like, comment, subscribe, and really do leave your comments. I will read them. Please don't be too critical. I'm telling you my bias. I'm telling you where I stand. But I'm ultimately, I'm looking to learn from you because unless we openly learn what different people think and why different people believe them, oftentimes we're just fighting in the dark. My prayers are continually with Jerusalem because I'm praying for it to have peace because I understand the turmoil and the internal conflict that are going on right there. And it seems to be the epicenter of so much that's going on in the Middle East and with the world. So on that note, good night, God bless you, and I hope you enjoyed.